Uh, thank you, Ambassador Tong. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, it's, uh, it's morning there, and my apologies. It's earlier in the morning than I thought it would be because I did not realize that the clocks would change in Washington, D.C. So instead of being 8 a.m., it's 7 a.m. So sorry to get you out of bed, and I hope you got your coffee. Got some coffee. Very excited to, to have a chance to wish I could see everybody's faces, but but um, but so be it. I'm quite jealous that you're now having uh, in-person events. We have occasional in-person events here, but it feels kind of like going to the intensive care unit with you know, all masked up and people staying 20 feet away from each other. Uh, well, we miss you here, and uh, we want to make you promise at the end of this, you'll come back and visit us in Hong Kong as soon as the uh, the restrictions are lifted. Sure, as soon as I can get a, find an airplane that'll let me get on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, it's good to have you with us, at least here in the Zoom room. Uh, we want to talk a lot about a lot of different issues, so let's jump right in, and uh, specifically Asia, because your portfolio has taken you to a lot of different places, Asia, you know, uh, six-party talks in North Korea, obviously Hong Kong. Let's save Hong Kong to the end because we got a lot of questions about Hong Kong. I do. We've already got some that came in, but uh, just step back for let's step back for just a second here. And uh, and and you know, th this is Tuesday as we're we're talking today. So the election was last Tuesday. I guess we still don't have a real winner, <laughs> even though it's now one week from the U.S. election. But assuming that Vice President, former Vice President Biden, is the president elect. Uh, just give us the the you know thirty thousand foot view first about President Biden and Asia. What can we expect? Sure, you know it it is relevant that um, this transition um, from from President Trump to President Biden is going to be unusual. I guess is a nice word to use that that where where uh, President Trump is still contesting the election. So there's certain to be um, some legal cases, a lot of, of uh, debate and and Sturm and Drang about the process, um, which at this point looks very much like, you know, Vice President Biden has a has a clear margin and and will be um, you know sworn in on 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 January twentieth. The the um, but the, it's important to keep this situation in mind because the um you know in in his remarks sort of a victory speech you know it hasn't he hasn't president trump hasn't conceded the election yet so it wasn't quite the same kind of victory speech that normally would be given but but in you know very eloquent remarks on on sunday um biden really laid down a, a the idea of some consensus-based governance for the United States, or at least um, cooperation between Democrats and Republicans to deal with these terrible problems that the U.S. faces, coronavirus, um, economic recession, and a lot of, of repair work that needs to be done both to the economy as well as the systems of government. And I note that because that is going to be his priority, and it's also going to be difficult because uh, partly because President Trump is contesting the election and creating a um, fostering an atmosphere of continued partisanship, which um, despite the best efforts of some of the more responsible Republican voices could prevail into 2021. So what is one of the, so that has two implications. One is that President Biden is gonna have to work very, very hard just to do some basic stuff, just to do a good job on coronavirus response, um, just to get stimulus packages out the door, just to get uh, an infrastructure package passed, which is long overdue um, for the United States, and then to try and do some of his positive agenda on healthcare, taxes and the like, which will be very difficult unless the Democrats get quite lucky and, and manage to, or skillful one or the other, both and managed to take both of the pending seats in Georgia. Um, all of that was going to, is going to be extraordinarily challenging. So conclusion number one, it's not foreign policy first. Despite the fact that Joe Biden was chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee for, for ages and is very, very knowledgeable about international affairs and will hire um, a crack team 
um, of both, probably both Republicans and Democrats, people who've been waiting for four years to have a voice in government, it's not going to be his priority. The second implication is that then what, what are the points of consensus that could be focused on in, in policy when, when actually thinking about foreign policy? And that's where China starts to come up, China and Asia. So the consensus, these are consensus points. These aren't Biden positions, but, but essentially everyone who is, is focused on foreign policy is saying that Asia is the top priority. Among, among, the top, among the Asia priorities, China is the top priority, but also that the framework for US-China relations is, has now shifted in pretty much everyone's mindset from one of, of you know, a mixture of partnership and, and, and conflict to one of overriding sense of competition and strategic competition that that concept, which was first introduced officially by the Trump administration, is pretty much absorbed by the entire policymaking crowd in the United States. But that, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that China, per se, will be the sole focus. So I think that, that one of the key priorities for, for um, President-elect Biden, future President Biden, will be strengthening relationships with allies and partners in Asia. That's going to mean listening more, talking less, um, and also finding areas of cooperation and teamwork that are China related. Because China is a priority, but rebuilding, strength, re-strengthening these alliance relationships is, is a key. And that will result, I think, in the, some of the first initiatives being how can, for example, the United States, Japan, Australia, India, um, ASEAN countries, Republic of Korea, work together on uh, maintaining a, a positive framework for economic activity in the region, um, dealing with some of the challenges that China poses, the negative externalities of China's economic growth, and dealing with the, the threat posed by, by China's growing military capability. And, um, and making common cause with, with these countries, all from a mindset of a little bit, of, you know, of competition. The, the last thing that I would say in that regard, however, is that China is a priority um, and we want to work with friends to help deal with that and talk to China. The difference between, one of the key differences you'll see, I think, between the Trump administration and the Biden administration is the Trump administration was not uh, a sort of walk and chew gum at the same time administration. They uh, had these cyclical patterns of policy. So, you know, President Trump went to China and had a, lots of happy stuff and, you know, dancing children and, and a trade agreement that was pretty much empty and but but then defended and then finally got to a trade negotiation and other issues were were kind of brushed aside as the president was focused on being mr negotiator with china and then after reaching one agreement and the coronavirus starting and the hawks in the united states were not necessarily just republicans starting to speak up all of a sudden, then things kind of go down, and then it's, it's President Trump, the rhetorical confrontationalist, which has characterized the last year of, of his administration, where China was seen primarily as an opportunity to score rhetorical points rather than someone to engage with. So that frame of mind, the up and down, up and down, driven by one person, no. Under Biden, what you'll have is is simultaneous um, you know, competition and confrontation on issues like Taiwan, South China Sea, Xinjiang, et cetera. Um, some cooperation on international organizations, um, health, you know, the, the world really needs to get its act together in responding to pandemics because 
one of the conclusions is that this is going to happen again and perhaps quite soon and um, environment things like that so working with china where one must and then negotiation with actual engagement with the chinese side on economic matters rather than this game of engage obsessive engagement followed by disengagement i think it'd be more continuous engagement whether that's successful or not it's going to be it's going to be uh difficult to tell sorry i went kind of long there but uh I think no, that's important to lay down as as the as the new president looks at Asia. But let, let me let me stay on that point for one second. It, it's I recall that almost every president I remember, starting with President Clinton, have always said that you know America is a Pacific power and this is going to be the Asian century and we're going to get more engaged with Asia, and they all seem to get sucked back into the same old conflicts in the Middle East or Afghanistan or elsewhere. President Obama said he was going to be the first Pacific president, and he ended up dealing more with Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya. Uh, is President Biden going to be any different? I know you said that Asia is going to be the priority. Everybody agrees. But is that going to really happen this time? So part of it depends on, on Asia. Part of it depends on the rest of the world. So the, the fact of the matter is that in any administration or you know, the American government, Chinese government, anybody's government can't just put events on pause and say, okay, world, stop doing stuff, <laughs> you know, stop having things happen while I make policy according to my long-term objectives and priorities. Now, China is actually better than most countries at doing that because China is, despite being the world's probably largest economy, um, is not a global leader. Right. And so it doesn't there's there's no sense that when there's, um, you know, a civil war in country X, that everyone's going to turn to China and say, can you sort this out for us? Um, there is still that presumption or or idea with respect to the United States, or at least um, hopefully more teamwork between the US, Europe and other leading nations. So. Hopefully. The world is a is a quiet, sufficiently quiet, over in the Middle East, in South America, wherever, that, and that the government can, can focus its attention on Asia to a significant significant extent and accomplish, a stabilization and rejuvenation of the of the region, mm -hmm. the benefit of the U.S. as well as the other countries in the region. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I think it, I think it, a lot of progress can be made. Um, the, uh, the idea that the U.S. would just drop everything else and only do Asia or drop domestic policy and do foreign policy is not going to happen. Um, the other thing that can happen, of course, is things in Asia, um, events driving policy as opposed to policy driving events in, in this re in your region, not my, I'm over here. Um, you know, North Korea is a prime example of that, but if China starts messing around with with its neighbors, um, that that could cause um, some serious problems as well, and then that could then be the absorbing, um, you know, absorb all the attention. Well, one thing you did not mention was the once ballyhooed and now much unloved Trans-Pacific Partnership, which you were one of the architects of. Is is pre a President Biden going to? Uh, revive the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or at least let the let the United States rejoin it. I think it's going on without the U.S. now. It it is going on without the U.S. and you know, most both corporations and um, Asia hands in the U.S. government are happy that it is, or or um, not you know not satisfied with the fact that the U.S. is not in it, but glad that it is going forward um, because it it is it's a good thing. Right, TPP has high standard rules for international trade and investment, and and other important concerns like state-owned enterprises, digital um, policy, and the like. That mm -hmm. as they as that coalesces among the TPP partners or CPTPP partners, that's a good thing. Um, it's actually a good thing for everybody. The U.S. will by being on the outside suffers a little bit from differential tariffs, but it's not a disaster. Um, it would be better if the U.S. could join it, um, primarily because then the U.S. would be able to assist in the political exercise of expanding it. 
um, which should be the next step for TPP. Um, but I, I'm actually not optimistic that the US will be in, in a position in terms of domestic politics to, mm -hmm. um, to rejoin TPP, you know, in the, certainly in the first two years of the Biden mm -hmm. administration, because it's, it, um, you know, there's, there's just, it would be, uh, he, he didn't run on more trade agreements. He actually <clears throat> was quite cautious about trade agreements as part of his political campaign. Part of that is the need to win the states in the industrial Midwest. I think, mm -hmm. you know, like like Hillary Clinton before him, Biden understands the logic behind TPP in terms of creating export opportunities for the United States, as well as shaping the rules in the region to the advantage of the U.S. and and creating a high bar for China's um, extended participation in the regional economy. But the the that logic is still very compelling but the the counter message of caution with respect to uh trade opening is very strong in the us right now and and the election results didn't didn't suggest that 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 the general population is convinced that trade liberalization works for them it's funny you know when you do polls um there's a lot of, of good um, surveys that are done and ask mm -hmm. general, you know, Americans, people who run small businesses and the like, is trade good for the United States? They say yes, trade's good because they they understand that exports are good and they want cheap imports. Okay, um, do, should the government do more trade agreements? Mm, not so sure, because frankly, this relates to another very key problem is that the, the proportion of people who say they trust government is very low, right? So essentially the public doesn't trust the government to do a good job with trade agreements. And, and those agreements are very easily attacked because, and, and because of their complexity and then because of the, the fact that multinational corporations like them, Everyone else in the country or the working class folks in the country assume that if if the people in the US Chamber of Commerce they like it, it must be bad for me. Yeah, so, you know, <laughs> go yeah. ahead. <laughs> but because on taxes, that's true, right? They it is kind of a zero-sum game between working people and corporations on who pays taxes. And mm -hmm. so they assume that the same is true on other policies as well. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the problems I I think a, a incoming Obama administration might have is that the State Department has really been hollowed out. A lot of good people like yourself with expertise in Asia are, are gone. A lot of younger people left. Are, what, are, is there enough, is there enough uh, talent and expertise in Asia specifically, but all over the State Department? Can that be rebuilt and can morale be rebuilt? Um, yes, the, is the short answer. I mean, I, I left on the, on the normal schedule. Um, you know, you, you kind of you know, it, it becomes time, but the the um, and I there weren't many opportunities for me in the Trump administration, but the 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 um, yes, there are there's a lot of talent, and there's you know the U.S. continues to produce a a, a huge surplus of internationally capable um, smart folk um, who are ready to go out and either in government or in business, do, do a good job um, on, on international commerce, international relations. And the State Department continues to attract a lot of those people, despite the systematic um, torturing of the <laughs> State Department system by both Tillerson and Pompeo um, and the president. And so that um, is, uh, it's really unfortunate and some good people moved on, but, but there's still a lot of talent. And really, the key is not so much the are there enough people. It is does the the management of the government like using the tools of government. So, you know, President Trump, for for it's very much part of his both his personality as well as his political um, pitch, was against government, against government people, against government activities and and managed to, to 
rather successfully run against government as president. So generally when you're a president, you're not like running against government, but, but he made it a good run at it, um, got 70 million votes. And that, that anti-government, anti-elite sentiment in the United States is quite strong, which is why he does that. Um, because he couldn't run on good governance, right? So he had to run against government, okay. even, though he was, even though he was the government. But the, the, the um, I, I think the Biden crowd is going to be much more willing to use the, the existing tools, use the, the institutions that are there. And they're quite confident institutions on the intelligence side, on foreign affairs, defense, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the FBI, the, the, the health agencies, they're, they're, you know, CDC's had a very bad year, but there's still a lot of strength there. And so mm -hmm. I think that the, the goal will be to to use and and re-strengthen the organs of government rather than than just kind of beat them up because it's politically expedient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the questions that came in uh, actually asked the question from Richard Ward, an absentee FCC member, who said, "Would you accept an appointment in the Biden administration? And if so, what position would you like?" Yeah, well, I'm not going to negotiate that over the over the internet. <laughs> but the 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 um. I'm, I'm quite happy with what I'm doing. Well, you know, there, there's actually, you know, to the point that I just made, there are a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. you, you guys know me because I was in Hong Kong. There's there's a lot of, of smart people and, and a lot of people who are, are willing to work for the, for the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's, let's, let's bore down a little bit on some of the other issues in Asia before we get more specifically into China and Hong Kong, which I know a lot of people are waiting for, but uh, you were involved in the six party talks with North mm -hmm. Korea, um, uh, President Trump and, and Kim and Kim Jong-un uh, exchanged love letters. They fell in love. And so like, how do you think a, a president, but he didn't get much out of it. They're still, they're still doing right. what they were doing in terms of nuclear right. weapons. What do you think, what do you think uh, a President uh, Biden should do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. President Trump kind of got to first base, right? The, the, the <laughs> um, um, you know, I think it's going to be driven by North Korea to some extent. The fundamental laydown in, on the Korean Peninsula is fairly stable, right? You've got um, now in North Korea with a with a you know relatively strong military deterrent. Um, you, South Korea with overwhelming military capability in a conventional sense. Um, neither side wanting to start a war. Uh, China, the U.S. don't want to start a war, so it's really a question about positioning and negotiations with respect to the the nuclear issue. And so, my own formative experience on this was, as you said, um, working on six party talks during the Bush administration, and then um, managing, trying to um, U.S. Korea relations during the. Bush to Obama transition, and at the time Kim Jong Il was 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 uh, still around, um, and for reasons which are still not entirely clear to the U.S., um, he chose to provoke President Obama rather than um, talk to him, even though there had been this whole negotiation history under the six party talks leading up to. Um, 2009, and there was a framework for further discussion, which was going not great, but it was going. And, and Obama was coming in with every intention of continuing that negotiation. And Kim Jong-il basically gave him the, <laughs> you know, by doing missile tests, nuclear tests, throwing out, you know, we were giving them food aid at the time, which was something that I negotiated. And, and they threw out our food aid just to, to, in order not to have any Americans in the country. And the, um, uh, and the Obama administration did this thing called strategic patience where they just like, okay, well, we're not gonna deal with these guys because they're unreasonable. Yeah. And so I don't, I, I'm worried that Kim Jong-un will try to get the attention of Washington through, by being a problem for the US, for the new administration, doing some tests, some missile tests, some nuclear tests, something like that. And that that will then lead to a whole round of, of, 
of of um, U.S. focus on North Korea, which will result in some of this, this basically the same situation of, you know, if there may be some failed talks, but then, you know, further strengthening of the U.S.-Japan alliance, further strengthening of the U.S.-ROK alliance, um, more um, militarization in the region. And, um, but that'll take up a lot of energy when in fact the, re the real focus should be on on patterns of economic development and commerce in, in Asia, rather mm -hmm. than than focusing on on counterbalancing against the North Korean threat. So, you asked. I, I'm that my main worry at this point is that North Korea will do a provocation, which isn't really in its interests. Mm -hmm. so it's true national interests. the The counterpoint to that is that Kim Jong Un has shown interest in trying to have his economy grow a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and not be a complete basket case. And in order to do that, at some point, he needs to do more than just trade with China and be uh, an economic colony of China. And mm -hmm. that um, is, uh, so maybe he'll reach out. You know, he, 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 sound, he seemed tempted by the, the Trump approach, but mm -hmm. there, the, the, there's not clear that there's a, there, there's a, a solution set between what the U.S. wants and what North Korea wants, so unrequited love, kind of. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it, 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 both sides want di something different, and and once they start dating, they find out that that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You know. Uh, what you know. We we've been talking about President Biden as if the, the administration's a certain thing, which it looks like it would likely to be. But one of our board members earlier asked asked me to ask you. You know, there's still a transition period. President Trump is there until right. January 20th. Uh, what can he do? Is there anything looking at Asia that worries you that might happen during this transition? I, I worry that that um, so one, you know, extending what I said earlier about China policy, the the focus over the past certainly the past six months has been on um, rhetorical one-upsmanship and then some high profile, um, not, but not terrible, super effective um, policy measures on the economic side that are completely mm -hmm. unilateral in nature. The sort of TikTok, WeChat stuff, mm -hmm. et cetera. And, and I worry that the, the um, Trump administration will try to do some of those things in the short term over the, uh, over the next um, couple months, and in ways that could box in um, Biden's room to maneuver in engaging with China, and I actually mm -hmm. think that that's probably that may be the intention, and mm -hmm. um, and and there are already you know plenty of folks thinking about the 2024 election, and one of mm -hmm. the things that, that you know the, the President Trump tried to set a trap for Biden this year. Um, by being tough on China and then saying Biden's not tough on China, and that yeah, trap Beijing failed. Biden, yeah, <laughs> right. He wanted to say he wanted Beijing to say Biden. Biden, Biden is a softy. I'm the tough guy on China, mm -hmm. and that strategy didn't work because Biden didn't present, and and he doesn't actually present mm -hmm. any realistic prospect of being easier on China mm -hmm. than than Trump does, and so it it, it didn't work, but. Mm -hmm. But the next two months are an opportunity for some entrepreneurial um, points scoring that then, you know, force Biden to try and unwind some crazy stuff. So I'm I'm a little worried about that over the over the next couple of months. I mean, some things there's an opportunity. For example, you know, you've seen arms sales from the U.S. to Taiwan like re recently, and that's kind of a pattern in a lot of administrations. Late in the administration, before handing over the keys. They do that um, in order to take some of the heat off the next administration because it's a necessary thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. The U.S. needs needs to make sure that Taiwan has a credible military deterrent in order to maintain, help maintain mm -hmm. peace across the Taiwan Straits, and we're committed to doing that in the Taiwan Relations Act. The um, so it's, a lot of that's actually a good thing, but mm -hmm. but there are other things in the Taiwan space that might not be so so positive. So. Um, it's a great question. I don't know what the, if anything, the Trump administration is going to do on China over the next two months. 
Um, mm -hmm. That's not the that's not the president's focus. He's focused mm -hmm. on entirely on internal stuff. But mm -hmm. but people who are thinking about trying to box in mm -hmm. Biden might might be thinking about that. Yeah, and and one of our uh, one of our associate members, Christopher Page, just asked the question following up on that: Does the firing of the Defense Secretary Esper uh, presage a dark and unstable period ahead for these next uh, seventy plus days ahead? Or will the military be able to resist any, you know, unconstitutional demands? I don't know, but my my guess is that that was um, that I don't know. I, I don't want to speculate. I, I, it it seems likely that there was just some interpersonal dynamic there, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. And and. Uh, Actually, one one of our other board members asked a question that uh, kind of a curveball question. They said, in your view as a diplomat, did President Trump do anything right on the diplomatic stage over the last four years? And could you think of anything that he did that you could say, yeah, that was a good thing? Well, the some of the of uh, the framing of the you know, it's talking about Asia, hmm? I don't think it was a crazy thing to try and, and reach out to North Korea. I don't think it was done with realistic expectations or um, or and it wasn't well organized but but trying the top down approach appealing to the 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 um, the head of the or of the North Korean gangster organization um, <laughs> is was um, you know it's worth a try um, I think that uh, the you know um, the Trump administration kept relations with Japan on it in decent shape. Has has further strengthened um, U.S. communication with India, um, with Australia. Um, the uh, the framing, some of the framing of the U.S. China economic issues, particularly the work done by USTR um, in defining the problem in its 301 report, was was you know, it was pretty solid work. Um, the uh, um, beyond Asia, I think that that it's useful that the United States was not um, in at the end of the day, there were some some frightening moments in the in the Gulf and with respect to Iran. But at the end of the day, um, it's good that the US was not dragged into any shooting wars um, mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Um, and that was clearly President Trump's personal inclination was to avoid um, that sort of thing, if possible. Um, the um, so there, there are some. That was the question. There were some good things um, overall. I wouldn't give high marks, but but it was, you know, there was some some um, a few a few uh, a few singles and a couple doubles. If we keep stick with the baseball, you started with curveball. So <laughs> well, I'm a Detroit Tigers fan, so I'm pretty depressed. But the <laughs> Let's talk. Let's talk China a little bit because we got a lot of interest in China, obviously, from where we are, and and, uh, and a lot of questions about China. The first one is if President Obama wants uh, President Obama, President Biden wants to do this reset with China, you know what what might he offer? And uh, for example, some people, you know, here in Hong Kong, were very interested at the FCC about the question of journalists. Could he, for example, lift these restrictions on visas for Chinese journalists in the U.S., which might then allow foreign journalists to operate in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong and in mainland China. What do, you, what do you think? What are the things that a President Biden could do to reset things? Well, I'm going to hesitate to get into details on that just because, not because I uh, don't have ideas, but because people might misinterpret it as, as authoritative. And I'm not doing <laughs> you know, specific policy planning for the, for the Biden administration. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends that are going in. We talk, you know, talk a lot, but 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 not to the extent that I could make responsible statements. The the mm -hmm. and 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 I question whether reset is actually the right word to use. So I think that the the idea that there that the U.S. and China are in a, a relationship that is characterized heavily by competition. Um, is is pretty much accepted, and so 
<clears throat> starting from that mindset, it's not a question of how do we get back to friendly? How do we get back to, to panda parties? Um, but rather, how do we actually make this competition healthy? And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's that the onus is on the United States to make some first moves um, or or um, fig leaves to uh, to the Middle Kingdom in order to put things back on track. I think the 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 the, the diplomatic dance between an incoming Biden administration and the Chinese leadership is going to be a complicated one and, and very much worth following. Mm -hmm. um, and and there might be some some tentative um, measures taken. The the you know the journalist thing that's a that's an example of something where one could see rather than just the U.S. saying well we're not, we're going to stop making things hard for Chinese journalists in the U.S. because it is a little bit counterproductive to do that. Um, it's not a huge thing because they don't do that much straight reporting, but they do do a little bit of straight reporting. Um, mm -hmm. But rather you know, have a, have a negotiation, if you will, between the sides. Like, how do we get back to expanded access in both directions? Like, how do we have China stop giving US journalists in China a hard time? And then, and then you know, so there has been a, a sense of reciprocity established rather than one-sided um, uh, abuse of the system, if you will, by China. And mm -hmm. that, so now that we're there, I'm not sure that you know the Biden administration, if it, if they'd been president over the last four years, would have done what what mm -hmm. the Trump administration has done. But now that we're there, maybe use that in a negotiation mm -hmm. sense rather than as a as a unilateral um, mm -hmm. gift to China. And the most important question in all this is going to be these tariffs, right? Because the tariffs are are bad for um, the economy, just, mm. just, it's just a straight truth, right? In both directions, bad for the Chinese economy, but, but also bad for the U.S. economy. So you want to get rid of them, but you, but it, it, now that they exist and business has adjusted to, and priced in, worked around, changed supply chains, et cetera, to the extent that they need to in order to deal with these tariffs. Do you, what do you do with them? And, and I think that there would be great hesitancy to just kind of lift them without any, any purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the existence of the tariffs, as was the case with the phase one negotiations, naturally mm -hmm. lead to an inclination to get, you know, roll up the sleeves and get busy doing some mm -hmm. negotiations. And I think the agenda could look a lot like the agenda that was ongoing in the phase two talks that failed. Mm. So we could end up with the Trump China policy without the Trump and without the rhetoric and without the kind of tweets. Right. And with, with, you know, um, and president Trump's negotiating style is to be unpredictable. That is great when you are negotiating leases in New York city. Um, it's harder to have that work when you're dealing with an, another culture, and country that is very powerful and has a different way of looking at things and doesn't trust you and and can walk away so being being unpredictable tends to to lead to the counterparty kind of not continuing the conversation and um so predictability and communication is also a good negotiating um approach mm -hmm. Can, 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 I, can I switch the conversation to Hong Kong? And, and it relates to China because the U.S.-China relationship now has Hong Kong sitting there kind of in the middle. How do you, how do you think a future Biden administration will approach Hong Kong? Uh, we just saw today or yes, well, yesterday in the U.S., the U.S. government sanctioning more Hong Kong officials now, adding to that list of 10 they already had. I mean, what do you think is going to go on with Hong Kong in the U.S.? Yeah, well, I think yesterday's news on that would, wasn't a, a huge deal, but it was um, um, an extension of existing policies, the right way to think about it. And um, the uh, you know, State Department was un had, was under instructions to to continue to to find people to sanction um, uh, consistent with the the existing policy. 
the the going forward, you know, I really, I, every time I hear, um, I'm not criticizing you here, but the the framing of Hong Kong as caught between the United States and China or between the West and China, there, mm -hmm. there is some truth to that, but the, the fundamental truth is that Hong Kong is caught between two competing Chinese urges, right? The urge to have Hong Kong be a London inside China that operates according to separate rules and therefore creates great economic benefit for Chinese development and the urge to control, which is very mm -hmm. powerful in the Chinese system. And it's mm -hmm. those two competing urges which frame the future of the city. And I think the mm -hmm. international aspect is, it's, it's more than a residual in that equation, particularly the, the foreign business is whether or not foreign business and foreign financial um, institutions use Hong Kong or not is a significant determining factor in the future of, Hong, the, of the Hong Kong setup. But um, what foreign government policy does is it's not irrelevant, but it's not the driving factor. So I, I just want to put that out as, as my fundamental view about the city. It's, it's Hong mm -hmm. Kong, the future of Hong Kong is decided in Beijing and, and in Hong Kong's interactions with Beijing. Mm -hmm. The, the, that said, um, what U.S. policy would be, I think, you know, there's quite a lot of, of unhappiness in the United States and in other Western capitals um, and Eastern capitals and Asia as well with the fact that China is messing with a system that works for everybody. You know, mm -hmm. the, the rest of the world likes one country, two systems with robust emphasis on two systems because the fundamental benefit to everybody comes from the two systems. And everyone's happy to go along with one country. You know, no one questions Chinese sovereignty in Hong Kong. Um, some, a few hand, Hong Kongers do. Does that provide a good reason to then upset this equation of one country, two systems? From the international perspective, no. I mean, this is all familiar territory for you. So what, what can people do about it in policy? I think the main emphasis will be diplomacy and rhetoric, to be honest. And um, it's not like there's a specific tool that the international community can use to um, force, quote unquote, China to do something different on, on Hong Kong. Um, what I would like to see and what I've written about, and I'll you know, give you guys a plug here for a piece that I published in, with Brookings Institution uh, in, back in August um, called Playing the Long Game on Hong Kong. What I think is important is consistency and focus and reminding China day by day, month by month, year by year, what the international view is of both China's promises on Hong Kong and what's good for Hong Kong and what's good for China mm -hmm. in Hong Kong and what's good for the international mm -hmm. community. In Hong Kong. Steadiness, steady drumbeat, rather mm -hmm. than um, specific announcements and, and mm -hmm. or like headline seeking behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and, and doing so with a unified voice um, among the, the main major foreign investors in Hong Kong. I think mm -hmm. is makes makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'll ask a question here from uh, Angel Kwan, who's one of a, a reporter at Apple Daily, one of our friends here. And she says, "Do you?" She asked, "Do you think the Trump's uh, earlier move to sanction Hong Kong officials and end the city's special trade status might be withdrawn by the new U.S. president, President Biden?" Again, going back to my initial laydown of priorities and um, political bandwidth. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure that that'll be a priority. Um, for one thing, there is a strong consensus, and I think I, think I mentioned this, but it, it bears emphasizing between Democrats and Republicans that, that China is a problem. And Hong Kong's, and China's Hong Kong policy is seen as a, as a representation of that problem. Now, whether the, the U.S. should have gone all the way over on, on and doing the declaring Hong Kong to be, you know, fully subject to quote unquote normalization, 
I, I personally disagreed with that. I, I would have thought that something more calibrated would have been useful. Mm -hmm. But then is there a, a triggering factor that would lead the United States to unwind its, its official position that Hong Kong has, has lost most of its autonomy? Um, I, you know, there needs to be some, some kind, something positive that would trigger that kind of, of, um, of unilateral action by the United States. Um, the sanctions piece, you know, it's, it's sanctions are just a form of, of, of rhetoric, to be honest. Um, and, um, uh, they, they cite, they call out specific people, which is, puts a punctuation point on a general policy. And, mm -hmm. um, and so again, is there a reason to take off the sanctions? I'm, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, along those same lines, uh, Emily Lau, who you know from the Democratic Party here, a good member and good friend of ours, I asked, know. <laughs> that, you know, it, you know, what what sh what more should the new administration and and Congress do to show support for the people of Hong Kong in their struggle for freedom, personal safety, and rule of law? Is there anything more they could be doing? So I, I I'll go back to what I said already that that I think the U.S. and other countries should be. Um, to keep Hong Kong up on the list of priorities with China and diplomatically and in their focus. And at the same time, um, not neither actively, not actively discourage business activity um, mm -hmm. in and through Hong Kong, mm -hmm. because that, that's the, the city's lifeblood. And so if you, if you try and use, if you try and make it harder for international business to do business in Hong Kong, um, that can have a lasting effect and you can't necessarily di turn the dial back, right? Mm. So it's better to have Hong Kong staying vibrant and having its positive impact on the Chinese system mm. and its positive impact on everybody's incomes, including people in Hong Kong, but people in the United States and people in China, keep that going. But at the same time, make clear that it is the analysis and do it credibly. The analysis of the international community is that this won't go on forever if China emphasizes control over, over um, economic freedom. And mm -hmm. political freedom is an important aspect mm -hmm. of economic freedom because I think you know it, it's, it's unsustainable to try to be London economically when you don't have a freedom of expression mm -hmm. and, 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 a, and a certain amount of democratic political activity. The system mm. starts to, to weaken. Governance mm. governance becomes less transparent, less fair, more more Beijing oriented. And so that it's that's a that's a long answer and, and sophisticated. Whether whether the international community can be that both consistent and subtle, or not mm. subtle is not the right word, but consistent and um, modulated and positive about Hong Kong. I don't know, but that's what I think they should do. Mm -hmm. That that segues perfectly into a question, an earlier question from the, the Washington Post correspondent here, Shivani Matani, who asked, given the fact that the national security law is in place and China has moved in, is there really anything the international community can do to reverse this situation? Or is it basically now a matter of just offering asylum to people who want to leave, you know, opening the doors? Well, it's not the responsibility of the international community to reverse a bad Chinese policy. Right. And, and fundamentally, I don't think, as I said previously, I don't think that it's realistic to expect the international community to force China to reverse that bad policy. So mm -hmm. the, then what do you do? Well, you communicate that it's a bad policy and it's actually hurting, uh, hurting China at the same time as, 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 um, as hurting everybody else. The, mm -hmm. the, on the immigration question, I mean, I think it's just kind of a fundamentally good thing for um, open, diverse societies to be open to people moving there um, if they no longer feel comfortable where they are. Now, the, the, clearly, there's a there's a selfish aspect to this. If if Hong Kongers decide, you know, the U.S. has had has sent some, let's say, mixed signals about immigration lately, <laughs> um, but but. Um, if Hong Kongers decided to move to the United States, um, 
that would be great for, great for the United States. It'd bring you know, educated skill sets, entrepreneurial people determined. And so I think we should have fairly open doors for that and perhaps make it explicitly open with respect to Hong Kong, the way that, that the UK has done. Not maybe perhaps not to the same extent because we don't have this British national overseas um, idea, um, but but you know be take a, a, an open stance and the fact that the what the foreign countries do in terms of saying that they're going to welcome Hong Kongers who are uncomfortable living in Hong Kong is less impactful than what people actually do mm -hmm. if if in response to that or in response to the situation in Hong Kong and so if we see a lot of people moving out. That's bad for Japan, China, mm. um, and 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 I would hope and expect that it would be interpreted as such. Um, the the international community having a certain amount of positive rhetoric about people coming to move moving to their countries, I think, is a nice thing. Yeah, several people have asked the question in various degrees of politeness about all the protesters who were waving American flags or make America great again hats, thinking that the US or the Trump administration was going to help Hong Kong. And various people have asked in various ways, were they mistaken? <laughs> well, it depends on what their expectation was. If the goal was to, to anger China, I think they, that was successful. If the goal was to make the US feel sufficiently guilty that it would um, try to reach beyond its means into the interior of China and somehow um, do something magical to save Hong Kong, um, that was an unrealistic expectation. So I understand the, 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 the urge and the communications, the, the headline gathering effectiveness of that, of that flag waving campaign. And certainly as an American, everyone's quite gratified. Well, they, they love America and they think that America is still <laughs> really important and, and represents ideals that they admire. That's, that's kind of nice. <laughs> but, but when I watched that, I also felt kind of like, oh my gosh, they're, they've, they're expecting um, something that's just not in, in the cards. Mm -hmm. Jody Schneider asked the question here. Uh, and a lot of us had it on our minds. Given that you were here during the protest, you saw what was happening uh, here. Do you think the protests themselves and, you know, did that actually, was that playing with fire? And did they bring on the national security law by not knowing when to stand down? So it's, it's hard to second guess history. Um, I, my own, what was it? Was it, it was what, June 15th, was it when the first, Violent protests uh, happened. June 9th, June 9th, I think. Well, June 9th was a big, big peaceful one, but, right? Yeah, that was a big peaceful one. Yeah, the next one. Yeah, yeah June 9th and 16th. Yeah, was, uh, my that's right. when they started was, using well, tear gas. Yeah. Well, anyways, the, the 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 I was the the first time that the tear gas started flying around made me very uncomfortable. Um, by by both sides, by protesters and then the police response. And then it's that because that that always can then lead to escalation, which it did. And the 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 large peaceful marches, the two big ones in, in June, um, if it had stopped there, I think that and and given given the Hong Kong government a little bit of time to digest that mm -hmm. and realize that they needed to 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 walk down from the extradition bill, mm -hmm. um, and 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 give them a little bit of time to react, there could have might have been a different outcome. I don't know. It's it's really hard to reconstruct things in retrospect. Mm -hmm. I think you know going invading the the legislative council. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see how that would be something that would would um, reinforce the better angels in the you know to use that phrase that um, mm -hmm. Vice President Biden used the other day mm -hmm. um, to appeal to the better angels in the Hong Kong government in Beijing by, mm -hmm. by desecrating um, the legislative office. Mm -hmm. we got we got time for a couple quick questions left. Uh, uh, one is, I know you the, the Financial Times and others reported that you left Hong Kong without being able to give the quote-unquote kick-ass farewell speech you wanted. You can summarize it for us here if you'd like. Well, 
I don't know if it's still on the consulate website. Um, <laughs> the the uh, the the and the essential content of it. Um, the I don't know. It's a long story. The 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 I I wrote a farewell speech which was quite moderate in tone, um, and then was was you know so now that the administration's leaving, I'll just spell this out. The it, you know it was fairly moderate in tone, um, and uh, but then made some pointed statements about the need for China to not. Um, uh, you know, exert too much control over, or so much control over Hong Kong that it started to degrade the business environment. Which, mm -hmm. when I started saying that, I think it was in February or March of 2019, that's when the first times we started getting demonstrations outside the consulate saying Tong is a bad guy. The, <laughs> the, um, uh, and, but it was, you know, it was true, right? That if you start messing with politics, it has an impact on economics. I think that's a, just a, a fact. Um, and there was more of that in that speech and Washington asked me not to give it because the, um, uh, because there was this trade negotiation going on at the time and, um, and, and President Trump um, was of the opinion that, that being clear and direct on Hong Kong was not going to help him in the trade negotiation. Um, and so that's kind of what went down and, uh, but everything that I intended to say has been, I've said publicly um, both, I did it off the record at the Asia Society and then said some of the kind of same stuff that night at the, at our 4th of July party. And, and, uh, and then I gave a talk at CSIS once I got back to Washington and was fully retired. So, I mean, it's out there. It's not, and it's not rocket mm -hmm. science. It's not like I'm the only person who mm -hmm. has this thing. So, but the, but the backstory was that there was this perceived trade-off between being um, speaking clearly on Hong Kong and the trade negotiations. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And I think we're just about at time, but one last question we like to ask all of our guests during this pandemic period and the holidays coming up is what are you reading now? And then what do you hope to be reading over the Christmas break? So the, um, I need to find a good novel for the Christmas break. I don't know if we're going to get a Christmas break this year with coronavirus, to be honest. Exactly. Um, uh, but uh, I need to find a good novel. I, 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 uh, I reread Watership Down in the, in the most depressing part of the coronavirus stuff in the spring, <laughs> just to be like wandering around in the woods with yeah. some bunnies. Um, the, the, the books, I, I knew this, you told me this question was coming. The ones I want to plug, um, <laughs> There's one called uh, um, The Great State by a guy named Timothy Brook, which mm -hmm. is just a fascinating history of, of China's interactions with the globe, with the rest mm -hmm. of the world, episodically, starting with the, um, the UN dynasty and, um, and the, 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 you know, the Mongols and, and Genghis Khan and all that. And, and, and coming up to the modern day in episodes, but then with very like specific vignettes. It's just fascinating to, to, mm -hmm. to read that. Um, the other one is, um, was entirely about, I've read a lot of US history lately. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, um, there's a, a book called The People, comma, No, is written by, um, what's the guy's name? Where is it? Um, Thomas Frank. And, mm -hmm. He, um, he lays down a theory of why the Democratic Party has lost support from the working class in, mm -hmm. in the United States. And it's quite compelling reading. It's, it's hard reading for a, um, a sort of East Coast intellectual to realize or to be told that, that we're the problem. Um, and, uh, and you know, but very, very interesting because he talks about populism in the 1890s and then in the 1930s and the 1960s and how that has not then um, resulted in liberal policy in the 21st century. It's quite, quite interesting. Fantastic. Are you working on your own tell-all book? Not yet. <laughs> Too busy. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador, Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> Ambassador Kurt Tong. We, uh, we hope to see you again here in Hong Kong. Perhaps we'll see you in the new administration. 
We don't know. <laughs> I'm not, we're not predicting. <laughs> we, we hope when the uh, restrictions are lifted, you can come back out here and visit us and we can do this in person. I would love to do that, Keith. It's great to see you. You look great. Um, and to all my friends in Hong Kong, please take care. Um, be safe. Thank you very much. We miss you all. Thank you for tuning in here. If you're in the Zoom room space, keep an eye on FCCHK.org for our future events. And we'll see you next time. And thank you again, Ambassador Kurt Tong. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.